It's early morning and the soldiers from Overwatch Battle Group West are getting ready to go out on patrol. This isn't a training exercise. The men are being briefed to expect trouble. Everything from roadside bombs to attacks from insurgents. Return fire if the target is identified, consolidate all personnel, I'll make a quick assessment and if necessary we'll fight our way out. The commander is Lieutenant Colonel Mick May. He tells me he wants to meet with a local sheikh. Today we're going forward, I'm going to be speaking to uh, Sheikh Razar, who is the um, co-paramount sheikh for the Al Zayadi tribes, the most the largest tribe in Alathana province. As we barrel down the road, our gunner has his finger on the trigger every inch of the way for two and a half hours. We have now crossed back into Almathana province. It's where the Australians were first deployed in the south before handing over security to the Iraqis. Security remains all important. And there's other diggers we can't see on the perimeter, plus patrols circling even further out. I thought it was going to rain yesterday. The meeting begins with small talk, but it's also an opportunity to pick up much needed intelligence about the local area. You know, Sheikh, that you're always welcome in Australia. <coughs> Sheikh Raysan has problems with feuding families who have taken up weapons to solve their dispute. Colonel May has come to check on the latest details. As the talking continues, something's happened in the distance. Um, we're unsure at the moment. The uh, kids are, are the kids are pointing to something. Um, I can hear I think, a bit of noise over there. Yeah, I think they saw something itself. Boys, get ready. We're going to collapse in. Our work trigger, you'll collapse in first. Collapse in means the patrols are drawing back to defend their position. It seems one of the patrols operating further out has been attacked. <laughs> the Medi Army is made up of fighters loyal to Moktadar al Sadar, one of Iraq's leading Shia clerics. And we are very sorry because now there is media <laughs> and this accident happened. Uh, it would have happened on one of the approaches into Samoa. So one one alpha. Uh, would have manoeuvring into a position in or close to a somewhere and uh, been fired at. Yeah. Right. Okay. What, what we'll do now is we'll, we'll just stay out of the road and leave this leave this for the police. There's no, none of my soldiers have been hurt. It might seem unusual that this heavily armoured patrol doesn't go after their attackers, but the colonel says. He's not interested in stirring up trouble. Yes, we could take the cudgel up and go forward uh, against the militia. I certainly have the firepower and I really do have a superior force here. But to actually do that would be like uh, pouring um, petrol on the bushfire. Um, so what we do is we actually disengage um, and uh, we leave the sabre rattling up to the militia. Just before we leave, Colonel May has more details on the attack, which included a number of rocket-propelled grenades, or RPGs, being fired at his troops. There was uh, something like uh, 
a report of five RPGs being fired at my call site. A drive-by shooting at long distance. Um, no uh, injuries or casualties occurred. Um, and, uh, and I was able to discuss it with the show. So he was very keen to provide us with support. He wanted to grab his weapon. Yeah, I saw him on his with, phone a lot too. Uh, and go with me and charge off after the enemy, but uh, we reassured him that it was a police issue. So and there was no harm uh, or, or offence um, against our business. And who were these people firing at the Australians, your, your men? Uh, well, it's not confirmed. It's highly likely that it's uh, Jayesh or Marty. Um, the Marty Army, um, a, a mobile patrol. They would have uh, had surveillance on the uh, major roads in. Um, they would have heard by the mobile phone. Um, they would have thrown some RPGs in a car and come out looking for trouble. So, and then clearing off afterwards. And then clearing off as quickly as they can. They do take long shots, um, impossibly long shots with RPGs, which indicates a lack of expertise and. Uh, also that they're, they're not very comfortable firing the strobes because they know we'll um, bite back. I hope the Colonel is right. The journey home is the most dangerous part of the day. Dusk provides good cover for an attack. The troops are edgy and tired. They've been out in the 50 degree heat all day. Next morning, it's off to the range for a taste of the battle group's firepower. This is an important part of the routine in Iraq, maintaining the weapons and the shooting skills of the troops. At the base that evening, we were just starting to wind down, if that's possible in Iraq, when I heard three loud booms. We were under attack. Someone was firing rockets at us. I was ordered to put on my flap jacket, my helmet and get on the floor. That's where I stayed for two hours. I found out later there were no casualties and no damage. We were lucky. I was told Dikar province was one of the safer places in Iraq, but the attack shows just how unstable the country is. The number of attacks on Australian forces um, since we've arrived in Iraq uh, has increased. Um, there's no um, doubting that. And with all this tension, and sometimes tedium, what do the diggers do for relaxation? Well, here's one example. This barbecue is held once a month. And here's a classic example of a subunit today. Just identifying that they hadn't had a time to get together. There's a couple of awards and announcements. And just by using their own common sense in regards to thinking about coming together and looking for it, we all share a common goal and providing an opportunity for everyone to get together and let a bit of stress out. But letting a bit of stress out can sometimes land the soldiers and the army in hot water. These controversial images of troops skylarking posted on the internet created a big stink. The army read the riot act to those involved, but the prime minister said the boys were just letting off a bit of steam. The incident came in a bad period for the army. It was still grappling with the controversy surrounding the death of Private Jake Kovko. Colonel, with the, the Kovko incident and the photos of, of soldiers letting off a bit of steam as the PM said, I mean, what are your views about that and the morale in the forces overseas, particularly here in Iraq? The, the, the death of Private Kovko was obviously a, a tragic incident. I feel uh, deeply for uh, his family and also for uh, the soldiers in the 
um, security detachment that he worked with. Um, the photos are disappointing, um, but the people who have expressed the greatest level of disappointment in the photos have been the soldiers that serve in the battle group itself. Today, it's time to head out again. It takes a while to prepare a convoy of vehicles, and as usual, the diggers are prepared to fight if they have to. We're off to a training camp for Iraqi soldiers, a key part of the mission. The camp is only eight kilometers down the road. But each passing car may be a mobile bomb. Every person a possible suicide bomber. You would think the training area would be secure, but a rack is so unpredictable, the diggers are taking no chances. They're checking for booby traps or other nasty surprises that might have turned up overnight. Yeah, you just got out of the back door, mate. Oh. Out on the parade ground, the Iraqis are going through their paces, trained, it seems, by their own people. That's different from last time I was here when the Aussies were doing the training. The other task that we have here in Mathana and Dakar is as a standby force to be prepared to provide assistance to the Iraqi security forces should, should the security situation um, turn bad. Four weeks ago, the situation turned very bad. The Australians were caught in a large firefight in our Mathana province. They were under intense fire, lasting over an hour. This is the first time they've spoken to the media about their experience. I mean, we had a range of AKs being fired at us, uh, a range of uh, light machine guns. Thankfully, no heavy machine guns that we noticed. And, uh, yes. you know, over an hour, there was probably out of that hour at least uh, uh, 20 minutes of uh, heavy fire. There was police on the street as well, and they weren't very far from the police, so we were sort of torn between yeah, sure. maybe they're helping the police, you know, maybe they're just civilian attired police. So we are held fire on that. Once things started to escalate, and our RPGs were getting fired. We'd taken a couple of rounds. The police were still just there doing basically nothing, but in their position, I probably would have done the same. You've got two enemies, on an enemy on either side, basically. Whoever you fire at, it's gonna shoot back. But um, we started taking rounds. We had to pop down. None of the Iraqi army people were real keen on staying up in the towers with us. Obviously, they located some of the pits that we're uh, positioned in and uh, we started to receive small sort of small arms and um, but only a small amount of um, machine gun fire at that time uh, just prior to them leaving the uh, Iraqi army barracks. After a while a distinctly louder shot rang out and uh, it mis missed me by that like uh, there hadn't been a cement wall there in front I probably would have took it but you could you could you could you could hear it going past you. Oh no, yeah it hit the cement like right there it was like three, four inches in front of me, an inch below. Uh, took concrete to the face and that from the... Blast. Yeah, from the blast. But after that, we uh, kept our heads down pretty low, just only putting the bare minimum up. And I uh, just kept sending all the info back that, yeah, you know, we've got a lot of people moving around. That's, you know, there's 200 people on the street. You can see people with weapons in amongst them, but you just can't fire. The shootout took on international significance. The chief of the British Army cited it as an example of how foreign forces in Iraq were making the security situation worse, not better. He said that British troops should be withdrawn soon. Well, I was there um, just uh, a week or two ago, and there had been um, into Al Mathana province, an Australian patrol going to have a, a meeting with a leader. 
and it was attacked. Um, and the view was simply by the, by the local militias, you've left here, why have you come back? Your presence isn't welcome. And they were attacked on that basis. The situation would be far worse if we weren't here. Um, and every country and nation here is entitled to their opinion about the war um, in Iraq. And his comments aside, the fact remains that we're here at the invitation of the Iraqi go government. We're here to help um, Iraq become a stable country. And that stability will only be uh, arrived at by an Iraqi solution. They were looking after the threat that was affecting us so we can actually achieve the break. Before I finish interviewing the soldiers, there's an emergency alarm. In that way as well, so they cover. They bolt out of the tent. They're like cats on a hot tin roof after the rocket of a couple of days ago. But it turns out this is only a false alarm. Meanwhile, even as international debate intensifies about whether foreign forces should pull out of Iraq, if you listen to the colonel, there is progress being made. You can become very Baghdad-centric. You can uh, look at uh, incidents of terrorism from a global perspective and say that um, you know, progress isn't being made. But we're well on the path to handing Iraq across to the Iraqis. We've got a vital role to play in that. And um, you know, we're at the leading edge of that process. Um, so yeah, I can see progress. I can particularly see progress here in southern Iraq. We've got an emerging government. We've got emerging provinces that are coming under Iraqi control. And we're seeing the emergence of an Iraqi solution. And it's, it's not going to be anywhere near what we consider normal democratic society in Australia. We're exceptionally privileged in Australia. I don't think many people realise how privileged we are.